of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Now, most of the time when, when we hear that said is usually when I've heard preachers say that before they preach. But that's not a, that's just not a preacher's verse there. That's a, that's a, a Christian's verse. Amen. So will you say that together with me this morning? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You know, as I, that is a part of the sermon passage as I was studying it, I thought, man, that would make a huge difference in, in my life if I just prayed that every day and really meant it, wanting the Lord to just uh, put a guard over my mouth and over my thoughts, you know? Amen. So, uh, it's a great verse, and we'll be talking about that a little later. But it is good to see all of you here today, and will you join me in prayer? Father, we give you praise, and we give you glory. We give you thanks for this opportunity to come and worship you. And Father, we just thank you that you have drawn us together today for this time to indeed worship you. And we give you praise and glory, Father, for who you are and all that you do. Speak to us today through the Psalms and through the, as we pray, speak to us, Father, as we, as we study your word, will you speak to us through your word? And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, children, come join me at the front. Thank you. 
all the children today. Isn't this wonderful with all the children? How many of you, I started to bring, I started to bring a flashlight with me today, but this is, this is one of my grandsons, <laughs> that, that's why he's loving on me so much, and I'm loving on him, but this is another one of my grandsons, but anyway, and the reason I didn't bring a flashlight with me, to, to use as a, a demonstrate something is because one of them, if not both of them, would take the flashlight away from me and start playing with it. They boy, these boys love flashlights, so I'm just going to talk about a flashlight. There are times we need a flashlight in it. when it gets dark and we're going into a room and the, we, 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 want, we want the flashlight so we can see. Maybe we're going outside. We need a flashlight, don't we? And flashlights can be fun, but the Bible is so important. And in fact, the Bible gives us all kind of guidance and instruction of how God wants us to live. And um, the Bible said, says this, your word, talking about the Bible, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, how, how can this book, this book, the Bible, be a light and a lamp? Well, when we, you know, that, that flashlight, it can give us direction on which way we go. It lights on the path so we don't, we don't step on something or do something we shouldn't do. The Bible, when we read it and when we study it, it gives us God's words for us that tell us things that we should do and things we shouldn't do. So that's, that's why it's called a light and a lamp, because it gives us, tells us God's word and what things he wants us to do the things he doesn't want us to do. And he wants us to obey him. So that's a good deal, isn't it? It's a good deal. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, the Bible, and, the, and how you tell us the right things to do, and you tell us the wrong things that we should not do. So help us to read it and study it and obey it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 This morning is going to be three, uh, 457. Let's all stand. Lord, be glorified. <laughs> Thank you, and we give you praise, and 
Lord, as we go out into the everyday world, let your light shine on us that others may see Christ in us and want to know more about you, dear Lord. Lord, we lift up all of them on our hearts. Father, you know each and every one that's sick and having problems. Father, we just put them in your hands. Dear Lord, we just uh, ask you to be with them. And Father, we pray for healing where healing's needed. And Lord, comfort where comfort's needed, Father. And Father, just now as we take up this offering, we ask you to bless the gift and the giving used to the ongoing of thy kingdom and for thy ministry. For it's in the precious name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus, I pray all these things. Amen. 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 special and you're going to have to do it and it's to the work I'm going to let you sit down you don't have to stand down. but you got to sing especially forceful to make up for it okay it's 615 by the way I don't think I told you it's in the bulletin but, uh... doing all four verses. Hmm? Doing all four verses. yes all four verses <laughs> Thank you. 
sounded good. <laughs> I invite you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. We're beginning a new series of, of messages today that we're calling Spiritual Habits for Spiritual Growth. You know, habits, habits get a bad name, don't they? Sometimes people will say, well, it's just a habit. It's, or it's, uh, or you know, and they'll talk about somebody that goes to church all the time. They'll say, "Well, it's just a habit." Well, it may be just a habit to go to church, go to church all the time. That's a good habit. Amen. It may be just a habit to read your Bible every day. That's a good habit. Amen. Maybe a good habit to pray every. Maybe a habit to pray every day. But that's a good habit. Amen. Um, I like to think it's a it's a habit that I I eat. But that's a good habit, man. I like to eat. Yeah, I, 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 I think I've mentioned this previously, but there was that, that commercial on TV where this guy spoke to me, a doctor, and he said, some days I get so busy, I just forget to eat. And I looked at Karen and I said, I have never forgotten to eat. In 64 years of living on this earth, I have never forgotten to eat. I've eaten way too many times than I should have in one day, but I've ne that's not something I've forgotten to do. But there are good habits, aren't there? I just happen to have a habit of eating. I like to do it. And because I like to eat, therefore I have the habit of going out and running three or four days a week. And they, they kind of play on each other. But anyway, we're going to be talking about some spiritual habits for spiritual growth and and for the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about spiritual habits that we need to have in our lives so that we can grow to be more and more like Jesus. Amen. You see, if we want to grow in our faith, there are certain habits that we must build into our lives. You may already have these habits or some of these habits, but even if you're doing all of the things we're going to talk about over the next five weeks, you can build on them. You can improve them. They can become more effective in your life and in my life. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 19 and talking about the spiritual habit of Bible intake. Now I almost put the words in their Bible study, but this is more than Bible study. This is Bible intake. Now what do we mean by Bible intake? Bible intake is reading, studying, well, let me rephrase that. Bible intake is regularly reading, studying, and meditating on passages of Scripture so that God's Word can work in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow me spiritually. Amen. Now that you've heard that, repeat it back to me, right? No, <laughs> I know better than that. I have to have it down here so I can read it. But I will say it again. Bible intake is regularly reading studying and meditating on a passage of scripture so that God's word can work in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow me spiritually. Amen. So it's regular. It involves the Bible. It involves reading and studying and meditating on, on the passage of scripture. That's our part. And then the Holy Spirit takes that, takes God's word and he uses it to grow us spiritually. Amen. So that's what Bible intake means. Now, if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to read Psalm, 1, Psalm 19 as you follow along in your Bibles. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech and there are nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And then he has set a tent for the sun, which comes like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the, to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous together. More to be desired than are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock and my redeemer. So as you can see, the emphasis in this Psalm of David is God's revelation of himself in creation in the first six verses and then in scripture in verses 7 through 14. This morning, we're going to focus on verses 7 through 14, and, and we're going to look at several things this, this passage tells us about the Word of God and why it is important to regularly spend time in God's Word. And the first point we're going to look at is the Word of God is described, and we're going to look at this in verses 7 through 9. And the first word we use to describe, that the psalmist uses to describe the Word of God is, is that the Word of God is perfect. Amen. The Word of God is perfect. Look, look, at, look back at verse 7, the first part of that verse. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. If something's perfect, it's complete. It's flawless. In other words, God's word tells us everything that you and I need to know about God. Amen. It tells us everything we need to know about who we are. It tells us about the destructive effects of our sins and the perfect sacrifice of our Savior. It tells us everything we need to know about how to receive God's gift of eternal life, eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It tells us everything we need to know about how to live a life that pleases the Lord. In other words, it's, it's complete. Nothing else is needed. So we don't need another testimony as the false teaching of the Mormons claims. We don't need a watered-down Bible as some liberal pastors and theologians claim. Because God's word is perfect, it also, it says, it revives the soul. Amen. As we read God's word, he revives us and that he draws us back into a right relationship with himself. Boy, that's a constant need in our lives, isn't it? Because without God's word, what are we going to do? We're going to drift away from him. We're going to drift away from him. That's why it's important to regularly spend time in God's word. In the second half of verse 7, it tells us that the word of God is sure. So the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It's sure. It's trustworthy. Now, we're living in a time when the world is constantly debating what truth is is what you, or what you can count on. What is truth? We know that God's word is the truth. We know it's trustworthy. Amen. Now, he has the word making wise the simple. That's an interesting word, simple. There. It refers to someone who is lacking in knowledge but desires to receive it. They want the knowledge. They're just lacking in it. So in other words, when, when you and I are really looking for answers and we come to God's word, desiring for him to speak to us, he will speak to us. Amen. He will make us wise. He will make, give us understanding. God's word will make us wise and without it, what are we going to do? We're going to stumble in the foolishness of our own thoughts and desires. Amen. We're going to stumble in our sin. First part of verse 8 says that the word of God is right. It's right. The precepts of the Lord are right, re rejoicing the heart. Precepts. That's another word for God's word. 
But the word precepts means this is God's detailed instructions which if follow lead us to living faithfully. Amen. This is God's, the Bible is God's instruction manual for us. Now, let me confess something. When I was younger, if we bought something that had to be put together, and I'm pulling the parts out of the box and I see the instruction manual there or the instruction pages. I give you a guess as to what I did with them. <laughs> Just laid them to the side. I don't need that. I know how to put this together. <laughs> and after I had messed it up or put it up, put it together wrong, guess what I was doing? I'm looking for that instruction manual. What? What did I do with it? Did I, did I throw it away with the box? Where is it I need it? Well, that's, that's God's word for us, isn't it? Amen. It's right. It's true. And we need it because without it, we'll mess things up. Amen. We'll mess our life up. You see, God's word is always right. Amen. It will never mislead us. It will never lead us down the wrong path. And it's never out of date. Come on. It's always up to date. It's not some old document that needs to be forgotten. It is alive. It's well. It's up to date. And when we follow God's word, it brings joy to our hearts. It brings joy to our lives because here's what it does. It saves us from the heartache that comes with disobedience and sin. Amen. It saves us from that. So it's right. The second half of verse 8 tells us that the word of God is pure. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. That, that word... Translated pure is used to describe the purity and radiance of the sunshine, the sunlight. Now yesterday was cloudy all day, wasn't it? Friday was cloudy all day. How did it feel when you got up this morning and the sun's coming up? I don't know about you, I hadn't even stepped out in it yet, but I saw the sun coming up and it was bright and I felt alive this morning. It was like, wow, I like that. Here's my term. Here's what I say after a couple of days of rain and clouds. I'll tell Karen, I say, I need some sunshine. I'm starting to feel a little moldy. I want some sunshine. The sun, the, that word pure seems, it refers to, it, it's, it's used in, at times then to describe the purity, the radiance of sunshine. God's word is the same way, isn't it? The verse I read with the children, your word is a lamp to my feet, is a light to my path. In Proverbs 6, 23, the Bible says, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. Just like the sun dispels the darkness when it rises, God's word dispels the darkness and the confusion of sin. Amen. Because the Lord loves you and I, he commands us what to do. He warns us about what not to do. And we are enlightened as we learn God's truth and as we obey it. Amen. It's not just enough to learn it. We have to obey it. The second half of verse 9 tells us that the word of God is clean. Now, that's not a, that's not a word we usually use for the Bible, is it? But that's what's there. It says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. That phrase, fear of the Lord here, is used here in this context as a synonym for the word of God. And it reminds us that we cannot learn and obey the word of God unless we show reverence for the word of God. Amen. The word of God is not just any book. It is the very word of God. And it is described as clean because it's God's inspired word and it's holy and it shows us how to glorify God. Amen. Also, it says it's enduring forever. In 1 Peter, we read, we read that as well. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 through 25, it says all flesh is like grass and all it's glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, 
But the word of God remains forever. Amen. The word of God remains forever. The second half of verse 9 tells us that the word of God is true. It says the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's word, his rules, his judgment proclaims the truth about everything. It proclaims the truth about what is right. It complains the truth about what is wrong. And we're living in a world where there's so much uncertainty and so many opinions about, about everything. So many opinions about what is right and wrong and what is truth. The truth of God's word is absolutely necessary for the believer. And beyond that, it's necessary for the world. The world needs to hear the word of God. Amen. One of the things that's excited me in the last few weeks is the revivals that are popping up on college campuses. And God's word is being read and God's word is being proclaimed and God's word is, and they're singing and they're praising the Lord. And the news stations are starting to tune into it. And they're starting to, to, to talk about it. And here's what I believe is happening. God is drawing people back to his word. Amen. Because even, even people that are not Christians, if they see a verse, they hear somebody refer to a verse of scripture, they may even disagree with it. They may not even agree with the Bible, but I promise you some of them are getting a Bible, they're going online, they're doing something to look up that passage of scripture. Amen. How do I know that this happened before when athletes Athletes have worn scripture on their uniforms in some way. And when they do that, the verse that's on their uniform, Google tracked it and the, the search on that verse skyrocketed during that game. That's not just believers looking at that verse. Amen. That's unbelievers. And that's what God's doing. He's making his word known. He's spreading it. It's necessary. God's word is necessary for the church. It's necessary for the people of God. It's necessary for the world. So that's the description he gives us here of, of the word of God. In verse 10, we see that the word of God is to be desired. It's to be desired. It says more to be, desi more, more to be desired than are they than gold. Even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. The Bible is God's word. Amen. And God is our heavenly father. We're to love God. And, we, and if we love God, then his word is precious to us. Amen. It's precious to us, the writer says, like gold and is sweet to us like honey. So here's questions we need to ask ourselves about desiring the word of God. Do we desire God's word more than wealth? Do we desire to, 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 to read and study and take in God's word more than a delicious meal? Do we have an appetite for God's word? Do we find satisfaction and feeding on God's word. Do we desire to come to church to study God's word with God's people or, or is it something we do when we have nothing else to do? Where is studying God's word in our list of priorities? Where is it? How important is it? Sometimes people say, well, I'm just so busy. I just can't get it done. I just, other things come in. That's what I'm talking about. If studying the word of God is a priority, we will study the word of God even if we have to leave something else out. Amen. For the believer, it must be something we desire. Not though I have to go do this, but I want to do this. I have to do this. I want to study God's word alone. I want to study God's word with God's people. And when we come to the point that we say, I have to, I want to study it so bad as much as I want to take the next breath. Amen. Then we're, then we're really desiring 
Do we really understand what the psalmist was saying when he said, desire more than fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb? How much do we desire the word of God? See, to have an appetite for God's word is a characteristic of a healthy, growing Christian. Desiring it. Amen. Third point is this, the word of God gives discernment. We see that in verses 11, 12, and 13. It gives discernment. Look at verse 11. More by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. The Bible warns us against sins. It warns us against sins we commit inadvertently and of sins which we willfully commit. It warns us. It's amazing to me when when you, when you read the Bible, how many times, going to the Old Testament in particular, when, when God over and over again is warning his people. Earlier this week, I was reading in, in Numbers, been in, in Numbers in my devotional reading, and I was reading about Balaam. It's a great story. Now, if I ask you, what do you know about Balaam? You go, that's where the talking donkey is, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. But what precedes that is amazing. I mean, what we have to understand is Balaam was really a prophet for hire. He could be bought. Amen. And there was this king named Balak that knew he could be bought, and, and Balak tries to hire him out to, to give a bad prophecy against the people of Israel. In fact, he wanted to hire Balaam to curse Israel. Well, Balaam did the right thing, and he said, no, God has told me not to do that. God clearly told him not to do that. So then the Balak comes back to him with more money, more riches. Now remember, God's already told him, do not go with them, do not curse my people. Balak comes with more money, more riches. You know what Balaam said? Well, let me go talk to God and see what he says. God's already said it. Yeah, God's already said it. God's word wasn't Balaam's priority. Amen. It was riches. Yes. And so because Balaam was not obeying God, he asked him again, and God told him, no, don't do that. And then finally God, finally God said, apparently you're going to do it. So he did it, and that's where the whole riding the donkey and the donkey talking to him came in and God said if you won't listen to me maybe he'll listen to a donkey and God by the way God speaking through a donkey always gives me encouragement as a preacher <laughs> he can do it through a donkey he can do it through me but see God was speaking to Balaam directly and sometimes oftentimes when we read God's word he speaks to us and says don't do that this is a sin. Don't do that. And what do we do? We're like Balaam. Well, let me go pray about that. No, there's certain things when God says, do not, thou shalt not, we don't have to pray about. We know it's wrong. Amen. It warns us against sins. It also rewards us when we obey the word because it keeps us from giving into temptation and sin. Look at verse 12. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. That hidden faults, that's a, that's a great phrase right there. That refers to sins that we may not even realize we've committed. It could be that we commit them so much we don't, we just go right on by them. But you know, see, because of our sin nature, we all suffer from this. We all do things, we say things, we think things that are sinful without even realizing them. It is not that we set out to sin, but we just sin. But as we dig into God's word and we allow it to take root in our lives, God, God begins through his word to show us the sins in our lives that we have not seen, our hidden faults. Look at verse 13. Keep back from your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. These 
presumptuous sins or sins which we willfully commit because we presume that we can get away with them or we presume that because in our minds these sins are insignificant, then they're also insignificant in God's eyes. Amen. We're assuming that God's okay because we don't consider it a sin. Amen. Even though God's word will clearly proclaim it a sin, we, con we convince ourselves it's not. These two areas, hidden faults, presumptuous sins, are two areas that will stunt our spiritual growth. They keep us from growing in Christ. They keep us from being all that God wants us to be. But here's the reality. These two areas cover every sin in our lives. Amen. Sins that we do without thinking and sins that we <laughs> willfully commit. So how do we avoid those sins? It's only by regularly and intentionally reading and studying God's word can we have victory in these areas. Amen. God's word, God gave us his word not just to fill our heads with knowledge, but to transform our hearts. Amen. God gave us his word to make us holy, not just knowledgeable. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Oh, we desperately need God's word to work in our lives that way, don't we? It's so easy for us to fool ourselves into thinking that we are more spiritual than we really are. But God's word reminds us God's word remedies this because when we read and study the Bible, God opens our eyes and he enables us to see the truth about ourselves. Amen. And that brings us to the last point. The word of God deserves our devotion. Read that. Listen to that last verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And oftentimes, as I said earlier, we pull that verse out and we, we say it before we preach, before we teach, or, or whatever we may be doing. But look at it in the context of all he's just said about God's word. Is he not asking God to cleanse him? Is he not asking God to purify him? I mean, hear the heart of David in this, this last verse, and, and may it also be the devotion of our heart. Amen. He's not saying, Lord, magically take all the bad words out and all the bad intentions out right now before I speak. He's saying, may every word of my mouth, may every meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. Change, what was he saying? Change my heart. Change my heart, Lord. How did that happen? He, remember, he's just got through with all these verses on the word of God, and it brings him to the point that he realizes, I believe he realizes there's sin in his life, and he wants to get rid of that sin because he wants his, his words and his thoughts pure. And the only one who can do that is Jesus. The only one who can do that is the Lord God. Amen. May that be our devotion. Yeah. May we desire that every thought, every word, every action of ours be acceptable to the Lord. Amen. Now, will we achieve that in this life? I can give you the clear answer. No, we will not. But as we hear and obey the word of God, he will transform, transform us more and more to be like Jesus. Amen. More and more. It's a process. It's a journey. And it will end when he takes us home and we stand face to face with our Lord and we're completely sanctified, glorified, and we're completely like him. 
And sin is not in our presence or in our hearts or in our minds anymore, but until then, we need to regularly spend time in God's Word so He can transform our hearts. Now, let me conclude. This is going to be real quick. Conclude with five practical ways for Bible intake. Very quick. Number one, read the Bible regularly. Amen. Read the Bible regularly. Number two, reflect on it. That is, meditate on it regularly. Think about it, what you read. Amen. Number three, remember it. That is, me memorize it. Now, I, I can hear you thinking now. Do you know how old I am? I can't memorize anything. I got an answer for that one. Write it out, print it out, put it on the mirror in your in your bathroom, put it on the on the sun visor in your car, put it on the dash in your car, and just glance at it and read it throughout the day. Amen. Number four, recount it. So we have read it, reflect on it, remember it, recount it. That is, share it with someone. Share it in some way. Share it. This is what I was reading in God's Word this morning. It meant some, meant, this is what it meant to me. And then here's the last one. Respond to it. That is, just obey it. Amen. Obey it. It's not, it's not a book. It's not like, you know, I can read a novel and finish that novel, put the novel down and never pick it up again. You don't do that with God's Word. Amen. You read it, you study it, you take it into your life, every day of your life, as long as you live, as long as you can. And in the process, the Lord will transform us so that the, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will be pleasing to Him. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise for this incredible passage of scripture that your servant David wrote and reminds us of how important your word is in our lives. Lord, forgive us when we have neglected it. Forgive us, Lord, when it's become less of a priority or no priority in our lives. Forgive, it, forgive us, Lord, when we've just read it and gained knowledge, but it hasn't transformed our thoughts or our minds or our actions. Forgive us, Lord. And draw us back to yourself. And may, may each of us commit here today that, that we're going to make God's word a priority in our life. Studying it, reflecting on it, sharing it, living it out. We're going to make it a priority in our lives. May that be the, may that be the conviction you bring all of us under, Father. So that we can be more of the people you call us to be. And Lord, as we stand here and sing in just a few moments. If there's anyone, I, I pray that you're still speaking to all of our hearts. And if there's anyone here that needs to make a, a, a public a confession of some kind, they need to come and pray at this altar. They need they ask, they would like for me to pray with them. Whatever their needs may be, Father, I pray that we'll respond to you in obedience to your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of decision is hymn 305. I have decided to follow Jesus. If you need to respond publicly, won't you come as we stand and sing?